The gas and electric lights cast a warm glow from the tall windows as a crowd gathered at Marquette and Third in the gloom of a leaden January sky. It was raining and had been since three o'clock in the afternoon the day before. The Illinois River had risen two feet in the last twelve hours, but the weather could not keep the town's residents at home. That afternoon, just before three o'clock, members of the LaSalle Art Club joined librarian Willa Garver and the members of the library board of trustees beneath the ornamental skylight in the elegant columned forecourt. As the grandfather clock struck the hour, the doors were opened and visitors were welcomed for the first time to the new LaSalle Public Library. Built to the plans and specifications of the library board, the library's new wood, leather, and paper fragrances embraced guests, while the beautiful mosaic tile beneath their sodden shoes gaily accepted the mud that had journeyed from the plank sidewalk outside. The year was 1907. The idea of a community-free public library began 23 years earlier, when a group of people including LaSalle dry goods merchant Francis Kilduff and his wife Elizabeth formed a literary club in LaSalle above their mercantile in the 700 block of First Street. The club successfully raised money through their amateur theatricals and entertainments to fund a small library. It remained at this location until 1889 when business leader F. W. Matheson offered a room at the remodeled Congregational Church at 4th and Joliet Street. Matheson donated furnishings for the more spacious quarters and in 1890 the library was incorporated as the LaSalle Library Association. The public now had a free reading room, but only those with a $3 annual membership card were entitled to borrow material. By 1896, the collection boasted 1,245 volumes and nearly 40 periodicals. In 1904, Reverend Albert H. Jordan, pastor of the Congregational Church, noting the lack of capital for a separate library building, approached steel industrialist Andrew Carnegie, known for his philanthropy to public libraries. In his simple, handwritten, two-page letter, Jordan writes, No doubt my letter will be only one among thousands appealing to you for aid. And yet I ask you to bear with me while I try to state some of the conditions in this town with reference to the very dire need of library facilities. LaSalle is one of the oldest towns in Illinois and is made up almost entirely of a laboring class of people. At present, there are in the neighborhood of 12,000 inhabitants in LaSalle itself. Peru joins it immediately upon the west, with about 6,000 residents. Spring Valley and Ladd, having in the neighborhood of 1,000 people, are now in immediate communication by streetcar lines. Across the river is the village of Oglesby, with about 2,000 more people. Besides these 20,000 people, there are various mining camps around which would furnish their quota of readers. Small, it's true, but nevertheless valuable. For future prospects of the community, Jordan's letter continued. For 20 years, a few citizens have planned faithfully and gradually to establish on a sure foundation a library which would be helpful to many young people in this community whose opportunities to further their grammar school education are very much restricted. Six months later, on a warm June day, Carnegie's representative, James Bertram, wrote to Jordan with a promise of $20,000. Despite the generous sum, once bids were let, it was clear that more money would be required. Carnegie provided an additional $5,000. Subscriptions raised another $4,000 to purchase lots for the structure to be located on the northwest corner of 3rd and Marquette. The architect selected to design the new structure was V.A. Madison. His plans called for a building of the Italian Renaissance style, built of cut stone and impervious vitrified bricks set in a Flemish bond pattern. The library's entrance would face Marquette Street. The children's reading room would overlook 3rd Street while the adult reading area would look to the north. The groundbreaking took place in the autumn of 1905. Two months later, in a letter to the library board, Madison reports. The building, which is within a few feet of the first story floor line today, the inside walls being now at joist height, 
At present rate of progress, the walls will be to the joist height by Saturday. The association continued to support the library with funds generated by dramatic and musical productions until 1906, when it conveyed responsibility to the LaSalle Public Library Board of Trustees. In August, the library purchased furnishings, which included a magazine rack, a desk and chair for the librarian, a specially designed delivery table, a high stool, a trustee table, 36 chairs, 6 armchairs, an 18-hole umbrella rack, and six large oak tables that remain in use today. A 30-tray card catalog cabinet was also purchased to house the bibliographic records of the collection, replacing the 1896 paper catalog. In December 1906, the LaSalle Art and History Club held an art exhibit as a fundraiser to fund the purchase of artwork as a gift to the library. The club selected three pieces, Sir Gallaghan by noted English painter and sculptor George Frederick Watts, a carbon print of Turner's masterpiece The Fighting Temechea and Aurora by Guido Reni, his interpretation of the goddess Dawn. Also in December 1906, Willa Garver was hired as the first librarian. Shortly after the new year, the contents of the old library were moved, including the complete collection of 3,364 books. Residents 10 years of age or older could visit the library from 2 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. and from 7.30 p.m. until 9 p.m., six days a week, closed Sundays. Non-residents were asked to pay a $1 fee for the privilege. The library has always encouraged and facilitated the personal exploration of ideas. In 1907, the collection included books that reflected the issues of the times. Notable books examined topics like American labor and women's issues. For example, the collection included the novels of Louisa May Alcott, author of many titles including Little Women and Work. The title work, published in 1872, examined women's independence. Very much interested in women's suffrage, Alcott's books helped to shape attitudes, which eventually brought about passage of the 19th Amendment, granting American women the right to vote. 13 years after the LaSalle Public Library first opened its doors. Upton Sinclair's groundbreaking novel, The Jungle, envisioned to inflame public opinion against the horrendous working conditions in Chicago's meatpacking industry, in fact created a furor against unsanitary conditions in food handling. In an effort to save their industry, meatpackers asked the government to add inspectors to the lines. That request coupled with the public outcry resulting from the power of Sinclair's novel, resulted in the creation of today's Food and Drug Administration. Among the non-fiction titles in 1907, patrons could reference from Bartlett's familiar quotations, or explore a six-volume work by George Bancroft's entitled History of the United States of America, which encompassed facts about America's 45 states. Just a few months after being placed on the library shelves, these fine volumes became obsolete when the Indian Territory of Oklahoma became the 46th state. Fiction titles, primarily romance, directed at female audiences were popular books of the day. The Lady of the Decoration by Frances Little, 1907's bestseller, is a compelling story of a woman who moves to Yokohama, Japan. To Have and to Hold by Mary Johnston is considered a classic historical romance Another favorite of the time, The Virginian, by Owen Wister, told an exotic story of the American West. It is a romantic tale filled with cowpuncher, chivalry, and daring. The book was dedicated to then-president Theodore Roosevelt, an ardent fan of the open spaces that the American West offered. Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility remain as popular today as they were a century ago. Library patrons had the opportunity to check out Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, a book that had been banned in many libraries because, as the records report, of its tawdry subject manner and the coarse language in which it was narrated. It remains today one of the most challenged books of all time and has a place on this library shelves for today's readers. If a patron found a Twain book already checked out, the author's works might be found in the library's collection of periodicals, in an issue of Atlantic Magazine, a literary and cultural periodical. Another periodical from the early years, Century Magazine, offered patrons political views. In a 1907 issue, 
an article entitled Thomas Jefferson and Tomorrow offered a cautionary warning about relying on old ideas and a new century. It made a case for a free society and honest politicians. Newspapers were also available to patrons. On January 19, 1907, patrons could read the LaSalle Daily Tribune, covering stories that included local flooding, a national shortage of freight cars, and an earthquake in Jamaica that rivaled San Francisco's quake of just a year before. The early 20th century saw a significant change in children's books that reflected the society's views of childhood as a time of exploration and joy. Among the books in the library's early youth service collection was Sarah K. Bolton's biographical anthology, Girls Who Became Famous, which included figures like Harriet Beecher Stowe, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and Florence Nightingale. Fiction choices included Stevenson's Treasure Island, Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, and Jules Verne's science fiction classic, From the Earth to the Moon. Little did readers know that a visit to the very same library 62 years hence would allow them to read about the first human to walk on the moon. In a visit to this library in the future, patrons would use library computers to Google pictures of planet Earth. Late in October 1907, Willa Garver, having helped launch the library, resigned her post and Catherine Coleman became head librarian a position she would hold for 16 years. Over the next 10 years, furnishings were purchased to make the library more comfortable. In June 1911, the board approved the purchase of a fan due to the unbearable heat and a dozen light bulbs. Along with these minor purchases, the library continued to build the collection. By 1917, it had grown to nearly 21,000 volumes. In 10 short years, the library had taken its place as a much-used public facility. In the summer of 1917, because of an outbreak of smallpox, diphtheria, and scarlet fever, the board met to discuss the possibility of destroying the library's cherished collection to stop the spread of disease. Fortunately, it was agreed that the materials themselves were not the cause of contagion. In the next year, the worldwide pandemic of Spanish influenza did cause the library board to close the building for a length of time. From its earliest years, the library has provided resources for learning and leisure both within the physical building and in community outreach. In 1912, the board adopted an amendment that would allow non-resident physicians to use the library's medical collections free of charge. The library's medical volumes provided a regional medical library for physicians until 1915 when these volumes were moved to the newly constructed Hygienic Institute. In 1915, and again in 1917, with the library's collection at nearly 21,000 volumes, the board voted to honor the Village of Cherry's request for any extra books by providing materials to that community. As a public institution and a recognized place of learning, the library has served the community in many ways. The library's lower level housed a kindergarten classroom in 1914. In 1919, due to an exceptionally large enrollment, the library provided classroom space for 8th grade public school children. In 1934, under a New Deal program, the library again served as classroom space for kindergarten children. Evening services for the Baptist Church were held in the library's lower level in 1935. In 1957, the library was used two days each week by the newly formed Lighted Way School, and in the same year was used by the Social Security Administration. The next year, the Civil War Debating Club used the library's reading room for debates. In 1963, the University of Illinois circulated its extension courses via the library. And in 1983, telecourses for college credit offered by Illinois Valley Community College became available at the library. The library has always taken an active role in the community. In 1918, weekly library services were delivered to West Clox on site. West Clox employees could choose from 150 books without leaving their workplace, with a branch library established in 1926. In 1921, a similar program was set up for students at Grant School. The enthusiastic response led to the opening of a branch library there and at Matheson School in 1927. In 1973, the library again partnered with Matheson School in a celebration of National Library Week. 
1975 and 1976, the library hosted two-day library information and bookbinding workshops for Girl Scouts. In 1989, Library services were extended to residents in the area nursing homes, an outreach program that continues today. The library continues to work with schools, community groups, and businesses to extend library resources beyond the library walls. The library is a place of community connections. In 1952, the library served as a registration point for the city's centennial celebration and exhibited the centennial display. More recently, the library functioned as a meeting place for the press and public in the aftermath of the 2004 Utica tornado. As a provider of information, the library has presented programs to assist seniors following passage of federal Medicare changes, facilitated on-site tax assistance, and provided a centralized location for various town hall meetings. Beyond our borders, the library has also played a role. In 1917, the library raised $6,000 for the Red Cross. It also conformed with the Library War Council by raising funds to donate books to U.S. troops fighting in Europe. During the years of World War I, library circulation fell radically from nearly 15,000 in 1914 to less than 5,000 in 1918. The decrease was attributed to the many hours spent on the home front in activities that supported the war effort. In 1918, the Red Cross invited children to the library each Saturday, where they would knit small garments for the needy in war-torn Europe. In 1948, the library's campaign of goodwill, seeking a better understanding between children of all nationalities, sent a chest of children's books to France. Today, the library continues to send books to America's servicemen and women. Many groups have displayed information at the library. In 1955, Organizations as diverse as those involved in National Brotherhood Week and National Children's Book Week provided exhibits and information to the public via the library. In 1962, partnering with local interests, the library offered art classes on site. Opportunities for community enrichment are offered at the library via special exhibits and collections. From the nation's bicentennial replica of the Liberty Bell in 1976 to the recent subjects like African Americans in Illinois, Lincoln Through the Years, and private collections like the Alvin C. Karras History of Money coin collection provide a personal opportunity to view unique and rare objects firsthand. Exhibits produced by library staff like the award-winning JFK presentation encourage viewers to explore our shared American history. The library has long recognized its commitment to children and its mission to provide an avenue for lifelong learning and reading. In 1952, the library offered a children's summer reading program that reflected the community's centennial theme. By 1981, statewide themes supported by the Illinois Library Association were integrated into summer planning. Summer reading programs today underscore exploration of ideas and leisure reading and include music, puppets, children's author programs, as well as activities that encourage reading in all forms. In 1961, the library began Story Hours, a tradition that continues today. Over the years, the library's collection grew. In the 1960s, the children's reading room was moved to the lower level, and later, in the 1970s, a mezzanine level was added for more space. The collection would be expanded to include large print titles and Spanish language editions. The library began offering books in more ways than the paper and leather bindings of 1907. Today, patrons can enjoy their favorite titles as audiobooks or downloaded to their computer or PDA. In 1959, archival newspapers, initially loose and later bound, were microfilmed. Today, the News Tribune archival issues arrive monthly on CD-ROM. Beyond books and periodicals, the library offers other materials for entertainment and education. Music, for example, started with a collection of LPs, long playing vinyl records, donated to the library in 1967 by the LaSalle Women's Club Music Department. Today, have been replaced with a diverse collection that includes cassettes and CDs. Much of the progress and extension of library service was initiated and overseen by longtime librarian Tessie Yap. In 1970, 
In 1989, the library began offering informational videos. Today, the collection includes both VHS and DVD selections for adults and children, both informational and purely entertaining. What in the early years were a few files, today through private donations and those from community groups, is the Alvin C. Karras Local History and Genealogy Room, an impressive and essential resource for the community. Supporting local research, the library offers links to outstanding online genealogical databases. In its first 100 years, the library has partnered with other libraries to offer the community even more resources. First by joining the Starved Rock Library System in 1972, and then the system merging with another to create the Heritage Trail Library System in 1993. The library expanded available materials to patrons via interlibrary loan service. In 2004, the Heritage Trail Library System merged with two other mega library systems to create the new Prairie Area Library System. Accessing the collections of nearly 400 libraries in a service area that extends from the Mississippi River to the Chicago Collar Counties, then south to the Indiana State Line, and from the Wisconsin border to just north of Peoria, encompassing 26 counties and 184 communities. Even more, the library can offer patrons the opportunity to obtain materials from all over Illinois and the nation. By 1999, the library was very crowded and in need of more space. The Board of Trustees met with Mayor Art Wyszkowiak to discuss securing funds and to acquire adjacent property. After funds were secured, including a building grant from the Illinois State Library, renovation and building of the 9,000 square foot addition began in 2002. Today, this construction houses the library's collection of nearly 50,000 volumes. Since the library's renovation and expansion in 2003, which made the building completely accessible to persons with disabilities and which created a meeting room, the library has offered many, many programs for children, adults, seniors, and families. Today, weekly and monthly programs are provided for many preschools, grammar school classes, and Head Start groups. In addition, the library plans special programming for students interested in history and science fair. Monthly programs, including films from the National Gallery of Art, are presented for adults and special groups. Adult computer classes are also offered to help patrons better utilize electronic resources. With today's electronic capabilities, library patrons have the convenience to order and renew books from home via the online catalog. They can browse the library's new acquisitions and learn about upcoming events on the library's website. They can chat live with an experienced reference librarian to satisfy their information needs without leaving their home. At the library, patrons can access the internet, send email, scan documents and photos, send and receive faxes, and make copies. In 2005, the LaSalle Public Library was awarded the Best Small Rural Library Award honorable mention by the leading industry publication, Library Journal. This is an exciting time for us in the community of LaSalle. As we embark on our next hundred years, we'll work hard to encourage every resident to take full advantage of the library's resources. In the nearly nine years that I've been director, I've been gratified, but not surprised, with a continued rise in the number of patrons, their challenging questions, and increases in circulation. In June 1907, Librarian Willa Garver, at the end of her annual report to the Board of Trustees, wrote, I wish to make mention of the warm interest taken in the library by the people of LaSalle, which speaks well for the future of the library. Given the enthusiastic response to library services and programs in the past several years, Ms. Garver correctly assessed the importance that the library held for the community in 1907 and today. Our library's tagline, enlightening and inspiring generations with generations of ideas, is the essence of what the library does in this community. It is a building that houses the ideas of centuries, be they whimsical, philosophical, instructional, divisive, or inclusive. It is free public information available for each reader's personal reflection for this generation and generations to come. In the end, it's not the books, or the computers, or the programming 
or the answers to the hundreds of reference questions, or the staff that makes this library important. It is the curiosity of the individuals who enter these doors that creates personal growth and strengthens this community. The library's commitment is to them and to their future.